I'm Nina Berman, I'm a professor here, and I'm a photographer. I head up the photojournalism program. I'm really delighted to host, I guess it's our third annual event with the Overseas Press Club, which is a big supporter of photography, has been for many decades. Um, super delighted to have Michael Robinson Chavez and Meredith Kohut and Judith Matloff who will be presenting tonight. So I'm just gonna give a brief, some brief bios. Patricia Kranz, the Executive Director of the Overseas Press Club, will talk to you a little bit about OPC and then we'll get on to the program and we'll have time for Q&A at the end. And we're thinking of being done by about 7.30. Michael Robinson Chavez is an American Peruvian photographer working on staff at the Washington Post. Before the Post, he was at the Los Angeles Times, the Boston Globe, and the AP. He's covered assignments in over 60 countries, photographing the 2006 Israel Lebanon War, the US War in Iraq, the events in Cairo's Tahrir Square, and most recently, ongoing violence in Mexico. He's a two-time winner of the Robert F. Kennedy Award for Photojournalism, and his work has been exhibited widely at photography festivals in France, Australia, Peru, and at the Corbin Museum and the LACMA Museum in the U.S. Michael is currently working on a book of photographs from Peru entitled Awaiting the Rain, which will be published this month. Awaiting the book is what we should call it. Awaiting the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm super delighted to have him here. Meredith Cohen is an American photojournalist based in Caracas, Venezuela, where she has worked covering Latin America since 2007. She's a regular contributor to the New York Times. She has produced in-depth photo essays about the rise and collapse of Hugo Chavez's social revolution in Venezuela. She's worked on stories on the drug trade in Bolivia, gang violence in El Salvador, and refugee and migration issues across Central America. Her 2016 coverage of the collapse of Venezuela earned her and New York Times correspondent Nicholas Casey the George Polk Journalism Award for Best Foreign Reporting and the New York Times Publishers Award for Foreign News Coverage. She's also received the Overseas Press Club Award for Feature Photography and she is the 2017 recipient of the Chris Andres Club Award. Among the New York Times, Meredith's photographs have appeared in National Geographic, Newsweek, Time, Bloomberg News, and The Guardian, among many others. So I'm also super delighted that both of them could take a moment from their very busy schedules to come talk to you tonight and share their work. Uh, Judith Matloff is a professor here at Columbia Journalism School teaching conflict reporting. Take her class. It is a great class. Um, She's the author of the recently published book, No Friends But the Mountain. I hope I said that right, because she told me a couple times and I've been spacing it out. Um, she'll tell you more about her work later in the program. And now I'd like to pass it over to Patricia Kranz, Executive Director of OVC. Um, hello. I'm delighted to be here. I'm a former foreign correspondent. I went myself to um, Moscow in 1990 as a freelance reporter. And um, Judith also reported in, in Moscow. So there's, um, if, you, if you choose this path, it, it's a, a lifetime of, of friendship and collegiality with a lot of really wonderful people. Um, after reporting about 34 years, I became the executive director of the Overseas Press Club, which um, was started um, 78 years ago by um, American correspondents who covered World War II, and when they came home, um, they wanted to get together with each other and have a place to drink and talk and make a club. And it's lasted all this time. Um, now, of course, we've, we've changed with the times, and um, I'll describe to you, to you a few things we do. Our biggest um, event is um, an awards competition that runs from November, uh, end of November to the end of January. We give out 22 prizes for international reporting for an American audience. Some are photography, some are digital reporting, various uh, different sectors. And um, it, it's a, a the awards dinner in April is a wonderful event where people who've oftentimes worked 
on their own in dangerous places get the um, the respect from their peers and the acknowledgement for all the hard work they've done. And um, one thing that would be of interest to most of you is we have a, a sister organization called the Overseas Press Foundation, which gives scholarships to graduating journalism students. Um, the deadline is um, December, I believe. So um, go to the OPC Foundation website and you can see um, what the requirements are. But you have to start thinking about it now. But it could give you a, an opportunity when you get out of Columbia to work in a, a bureau of the Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg or Reuters somewhere overseas. Or if you have your own project that you're dedicated to, you could um, continue reporting on, on that topic. Um, Gabrielle Bashkar is here. She's a, a current um, fellow, and you know, Columbia always is well represented. Um, and the other things we do, we're trying when we the club, of course, used to be made of up of people whose companies would pay for their membership. Um, of course, those days are gone, and we're trying to always come up with ways to support. Um, freelance journalists and young journalists. So one of the ways we do that is if you're a member and if you're a student, it only costs $20. Um, you can have a, a free um, wallet size press ID card if you join and then and get approved and send me your photo. And if you're willing to pay $50, you can have a, a more um, formal looking government type badge that, that some people find find they really need. My, my, the thing I love about these badges is uh, somebody worked in Moscow, one of my friends, he now writes for the New York Times Magazine about Russia, but he's freelance and Russia wanted some kind of press badge and the New York Times doesn't give them, so he joined OPC just to get his, just to get his press badge. Um, and freelancers find these very valuable, it sounds a little bit silly, but it can help you get into areas that you might not otherwise be able to. And um, one of the other things we're working on, it'll be unveiled probably next week, is a closed Facebook group um, that is um, open only to OPC members. We have a lot of members who are assigning editors for photography, for text, for digital, for video. And then we have a lot of members who are freelancers. So it's going to be a closed group where you can um, request to be a member. If you're a member, you will join. And then you can say, I'm going somewhere. Or an editor can say, I, I need somebody somewhere. And we're, we're trying to make it be a, a much more um, uh, helpful group for people to make, to make contacts. So um, with that, I, I turn it over to Judith for a, a very interesting evening with Meredith and Michael. Um, now it's all changed. There's so many different actors. Um, 
um, organized crimes, thugs, uh, narcos, um, large cartels, small gangs, and it's very, very hard sometimes to know who you're dealing with. Um, you're also dealing with severely corrupt governments that differ oftentimes in their region. And um, these two photographers working, I think, are one of the two most challenging terrains in world reporting overall. Um, in Venezuela, as um, Meredith will tell you, it, it's, it's a vastly changing um, situation where basically every type of harassment that could occur in a, of a journalist occurs. There's detention, there's assaults from various different parties, there's theft of equipment, there's beatings, and then there's the um, attendant dangers that come with covering protests, which is tear gas. Uh, again, beatings, white cannons, do you get that as well? I mean, quite a few bullets. Um, then you go to Mexico, which is an area I still work in quite a lot. I do safety training there. And it's, um, it's, it's just a bloody mess. I mean, over the past 20 years, 95 journalists have been murdered. And practically none of the murderers have been brought to justice or have been held accountable. And five of those murders occurred this year, so far this year. And um, it's likely we'll see more this year. And the situation has gotten so, so severe that dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of, of journalists, just can't do the reporting that they'd like to do on organized crime, on the narcos, or on government linked to corruption. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to hearing about how you navigate these situations, um, for which you're very brave. <laughs> So, um, so first we'll start, um, both Michael and Meredith will do a presentation of their photographs and they can tell you. Um, then we'll follow up with, uh, with a, a brief discussion and then we'll open it up to questions to the audience. So um, over to Michael. I've been volunteered to go first, so. Post in the state of Guerrero, Mexico, and uh, its its evolution kind of started with the foreign editor, foreign photo editor at the Washington Post, sending me an email saying, "Hey, how would you like to go to this really dangerous part of Mexico?" And it's like, uh, "Well, I, I love Mexico, and um, how dangerous? How how bad? Where are we going?" So we talked about it further, and to go a little deeper is that Mexico is a place that's been very dear to me for a long time. I grew up in Southern California, Ventura County, and uh, would constantly be going down into Baja to go surfing and camping and, and that kind of thing. So Mexico was always a big part of growing up. And I just deeply fell in love with the country. It's very easy to do. Uh, it's like a continent. It offers so much. Um, the people are amazing. The rituals, the mysticism, the food, the art, the culture, the list is endless of why Mexico is such a fantastic place. And it's been really tough over the past 15 years or so to watch it completely unravel and descend into the violent, semi-failed state that we are, are seeing right now. So Guerrero has become perhaps the most violent state in a you know, country that is already extremely violent. And unlike some of the other states like Sinaloa and Tamaulipas, where maybe one or two cartels had sway, Guerrero is sort of a, a hodgepodge of small gangs and, and cartels and you know, 20 guys hanging out in a neighborhood that are killing the guys in the other neighborhood. So it's, it's much more chaotic, and drugs are only part of the game. It's, um, it has a lot to do with uh, extortion, kidnapping. Uh, you know, they're kidnapping their neighbors to get a thousand pesos. I mean, it's, it's absurd to, the, to where it's gotten. So the pictures I'm showing here, uh, can you guys see that okay? Yeah. Should we, should we can we dim the lights just yeah. a little bit right. so it's not totally washed out? So this was in, uh, in Guerrero, in an area called Tierra Caliente, which is, begins at Iguala and then moves east uh, along to Atevirano. 
And it's a very dangerous stretch of road, and that's what this story was about. It's an opium highway. Opium has taken over. Mexico is the leading supplier of heroin in the United States now. And we wanted to explore what was going on along this heroin highway, as it were. And these, this guy is a member of an the defensive group. He's probably, I don't know, 15 or 16 years old. He has this ridiculous rifle that he defends this entry point into uh, Teruluapan. And uh, we hung out with these other defensive guys. And we kind of went in just to kind of talk about like, how we got to this place. Um, I made sure, before embarking on this assignment, to do my due diligence, along with the reporter, Joshua Partlow, who is a great correspondent. And he's based in Mexico City for us, for the Washington Post. And a graduate of the J School. Hey, there you go, plug. I like that. <laughs> Um, and uh, so with Josh, he went down a week ahead of time to kind of suss things out because there was no way I was going to go into the zone on a fishing expedition and hope that we would run into people like, hey, will you, are you willing to talk to us or can I make pictures in this opium field? And I mean, you just can't do that there. So I wanted to make sure you had good local contacts. I have very good friends that live in Mexico City. I talked to them about certain areas. When was the last time you were there? Um, local journalists who are really running the majority of the risks in Mexico. Uh, um, uh, you know, what are their feelings in these places? Um, the picture that was right before the title page are the military going in and destroying an opium plantation. So we had extraordinarily good luck. And when you go on these assignments, a lot of it is luck and good fortune. Because when we got back to Mexico City and we told people where we had been, a lot of the locals were just like, you know, that was, boy, you're really stupid. You know, it's like, you know, like, what are you doing there? And we just really kind of didn't realize in some places, like, that it was really that dangerous. And when you work in a lot of conflict zones, your, your th threat, uh, I don't know, I don't like a threat radar, for lack of a better term, you can kind of have a feeling of like when things are getting a little dangerous because the lines are more clear cut. So, but in this case, you just don't know. You just think you're in any average town. And there are no clear cut front line. There's no war going on that you can see. So it's, it's much harder to gauge. But with the military, Josh had put in for that operation months prior. And I was only down there for a couple of weeks. And it just so happened while we were there, the military called them up and said, hey, we're going to go eradicate opium fields. You want to go? And we were just very fortunate that we were able to go and do that. This, again, is with the Alto Defensas. This is on a road that goes to a small town that's dominated by a guy named Tequilero, because he just is drunk on tequila 24 hours a day. He leads a band of 50 sociopaths. That's decapitations, murder, uh, kidnapping, extortion, you name it. These guys do all of that. Um, they're really, really nasty, and we would not go further down the road. They just said, like, you know, I'm the place. You know, if you guys want to go, go ahead, but you're on your own. This man right here has been kidnapped twice. Uh, he doesn't have much money to speak of. His family isn't wealthy by any stretch of the imagination. This is one of the poorest zones in Mexico, certainly in Guerrero, which is, along with Oaxaca and Chiapas, the poorest states in the country. So he had been kidnapped twice, and this is him with his family, and he was recounting. Uh, some of what he went through. Kidnapped for seven days at one point, beaten quite a bit by Tequileros guys, and then they were made to sleep in this cave, and really nasty. That's at his house out in front. You, can, you know, it's a really, really poor place. Um, you know, that dog was on its last legs. Uh, this is in Acapulco, which was another story that I had pitched. So Josh had pitched this one about this heroin highway, and I said, well, let's dive deeper on the story. Let's take it further about what's happening in Guerrero and how it's being ripped apart, and how they're just operating with complete, complete impunity. It's, there's no recourse whatsoever. There's no law, there's no one, I mean, you leave the Manecon, um, the Costero, they call it, in Acapulco, and go two blocks inland from the hotels, and it's lawless. You are on your own. No one's going to investigate any crimes. No one's going to come to your assistance. The only time the police and the military go into these neighborhoods called Colonias, which are very reminiscent of favelas in Rio, the only time they go in there are to extract dead bodies. That's the only time they're in there. They're looking at a crime scene here. They're using Dixie cups to mark where the bullets are. This crime will never be solved. This was a homicide. A young man was shot to death on the street. 
people just walking through the crime scene, it's, it's, it borders on the absurd. Um, and so those were the two chapters we've worked on so far. We're gonna be going down and, and doing some more just to, to really, because you, you want to get deeper on a story like this. You just don't want to go down there and say, oh, look, Mexico's a really violent place, because that's already been said before. The really great hook on the Tierra Caliente story was the fact that it was producing all the opium, and they were starting to produce really high-grade opium and heroin to come into the United States. And fentanyl is going in there in large quantities from China. Uh, this is actually the family of the, the man that was killed in that street scene you saw earlier. And this is Acapulco. I mean, Acapulco was the place, you know, and uh, it was this Tony resort town, John Wayne, all these celebrities used to go down there, and now it is a complete nightmare. But that being said, you can get an oceanfront room for like 90 bucks a night. <laughs> it's not where you can. I wouldn't recommend it. But it's, you can see geographically, it really reminded me of Rio. It's uh, hilly, forested, um, very tropical, um, and the, the, but the colonies are empty. People have just abandoned them. They have left and gone to anywhere but there. And Acapulco is on the third most dangerous city in the world. Oh, there it is right there. So it's, it's in really, really bad shape. It's been like this for over a decade now. It's been going on. And it's just getting worse and worse. So as this is the coroner's office going into one of these moronias. They found this body buried in the floor of a home there, uh, dismembered and decapitated. Uh, and so they're bringing it out, and I mean, if anything ever comes to this, I, I, no one believes anything will come of it. So in terms of working in a place like Acapulco, I called a photographer I knew down there, Bernardino. And he is a local photographer. He's been doing this for years. Uh, and he um, knows Acapulco inside and out, and he agreed to help us. And so he's what you call a fixer, someone on the ground, someone local that can kind of help you get into these places, because I'm not just going to wander aimlessly into these colonias. So he helped us out, took us to a lot of these places. Um, you know, and, and, and there was something, he was very subdued about a lot of it, but I'd ask him, like, hey, can we go into this neighborhood? And he'd say, oh, you know, vamos, let's go into the neighborhood, that's not a problem. Uh, you know, you can get a good overall picture of the city from here, I've been there. And then we'd be there for a little while, and then you'd be like, you know, we probably should go. And I said, oh, it's not okay here. And he's like, no, it's super dangerous. You shouldn't be here. And I'm like, you mean, you've got to be, you got to be really upfront and clear with me on some of this stuff. And for him, he's been kidnapped and held at gunpoint and beaten. And, you know, it's like it goes with the job there. And it wasn't until later that every other photographer I met there thought he was out of his mind. So you know that he would go into places that they would have, they would never go into. For us, for a week, that was okay, but you know, for long term, it's more difficult. This gentleman here is a taxi driver. The rate of their homicides exceeds that of a war zone um, in that they're targeted because they're considered halcones, kind of like the watchdogs of a neighborhood. So if a rival gang comes in, they want to kill all of them so they don't tell them that they're coming. So they just come in and kill all the taxi drivers at their little city. That's kind of how they operate. This was just this extraordinary sculpture of Lázaro Cárdenas on this road. No one, practically no one in Mexico knew it even existed because no one goes here. A crazy Italian artist spent three years creating this thing on the side of the road and no one even knows it's there. Acapulco, kind of hearkening back to its glory days as a resort. Uh, it, was, it was tough going to work there. Um, when you're thinking about a lot of these places, it's not only the circumstances of access, danger, but weather, I mean, it's, it feels like it's 103 degrees with humidity there, and your energy levels are just zapped. I mean, it's really hard to keep your energy up and keep going. This scene right here was a festival for this patron saint in this colonia of Acapulco. This is directly next door to where they pulled that body out on the same day. So this is going on while they're excavating the body next door. Because I heard this loud umbia music. I said, well, what's that about? And I ended up going into this party and hanging out with these people for a while, making photographs while they pulled the body out next door. And that's the, the dichotomy, the paradox of Mexico right now. Auto defensive posts. Uh, the auto defensive guys were pretty good for us to hang out with them for a few days. But you never know with them. I mean, they could have a foot in a cartel, a foot as like, oh, we're helping the community, but you really don't know. Army patrol going up looking for the, uh, for the opium. 
and this is one of the opium fields, and they go up and they burn it. So they cut it down, they burn the opium plants, they have a radio, and they can hear the narcos on it complaining. They're burning our field, you know, those jerks and blah, 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 and they're like, you know, bantering over the radio. But in fact, when they burn it and it returns to the soil, they were joking about how the crop will be so much richer the next year because the nutrients going into the soil. And it's absurd, the operations that they're doing. I mean, it's just, it absolutely has no impact whatsoever. I mean, the war on drugs, we know it's absurd. It's like trying to stop the weather. So you, it's just, you can't do it. So, um, but, you know, they're kind of making good on their promise to uh, the U.S. for aid, but that now is in jeopardy with the strained relations between the U.S. and, and Mexico. Again, onto defensive guys, in Terra Caliente, uh, grave marker, uh, he was kidnapped, and then they didn't find him for months, and then found his body much later. And those are the guys patrolling the streets. So, you know, we, we didn't wear out our welcome. We would hang out long enough to get what we needed and talk to them. They were eager to talk to us, to put their best face forward. Uh, but you gotta understand when it's time to leave when it's time to get out of there. It's like they, you know, they start, you know, well, why don't you buy this for me? Or why don't you give me money for this? And then it's time to, to go. Uh, they stop cars and trucks and check on everybody and, and ask for a donation, which is pretty much a demand. This picture I made in Iguala, it's a city where the 43 disappeared, the 43 students. Uh, it's a city desperately trying to get back to normal. Uh, the kids are in this, you know, play toy, but it's a Cadillac Escalade, which is a car of choice for narcos. So it's just kind of interesting to see the kids playing in that. And this is daily life trying to return to a place like Iguana. They're in that city more than anywhere else in Tierra Caliente. We kind of notice that that they're putting on cultural events. The pictures of the 43 students are everywhere, but they're really trying to to make a comeback and do something about it. But they have a, an uphill battle for sure. And that's it. This is a hospital. 
hospital in Barcelona. And he's been in such a little in the abdomen. And when he arrived at the hospital, the, the doctors didn't have, or they needed to do um, a chest scan to be able to operate on him. And so basically, they said, um, sorry, we can't help you. You need to find your way to a private clinic. And also, um, you know, our ambulance isn't working, so you have to find your way, you know, your own ride there, too. And he was just laying there, like, bleeding out, saying, I'm never going to be able to do that on my own right now. So pharmacy in uh, downtown Caracas, over 85% of all basic um, medicines are either impossible to find or very, very difficult to find in Venezuela. This is from El Pampero. It's a psychiatric hospital in Barquisimeto, Venezuela. Some of the most vulnerable patients to the medicine shortages are We did a like an extended feature slideshow for the New York Times um, on basically what life is like inside there. Um, because the patients don't have medicines they need, whenever they have psychiatric episodes, the staff either has to lock them in, in like isolation cells by themselves or restrain them. This is Cleo. Uh, she was sleeping and her schizophrenic bumpy, uh, who was unmedic unmedicated, had an episode and attacked her in the middle of the night and uh, beat her severely and bit off her nose and then swallowed it. We found her the next morning, just like really crying softly under this mosquito net and uh, the staff had rushed her to the local hospital, you know, to the emergency room to try you know, to, you know, give her the surgery that she needs. She had a four reconstruction of her nose, and because of the medical shortages, the doctors, the only thing they could do was apply a bandage because they didn't have anything to, to fix her nose with. This is Omar. In addition to medicine shortages, they also have shortages of food. In this picture, he weighed about 32 kilos. This is a mom who both of her children had malaria at this time and also couldn't find medicine to treat them. So in addition to the widespread medicine shortages, there's also a lot of crime. Um, Venezuela has one of the highest homicide rates in the entire world. Um, this is a gang. Talk to your, talk to your leader, essentially. 
and um, I've never been told no. Usually, uh, you just kind of respect like the protocol and show that you understand that you're entering their territory. Um, I don't ask really for permission per se to do photographing, but I always like to just go and be like, hey, this is who I am, this is why I'm walking around the streets with a camera, I'm doing a story about whatever I'm doing a story about, and just make sure that we're cool. And more often than not, um, gang leaders or mafia leaders will actually say, like, okay, don't worry, I'll make sure, um, you know, not only will my guys not mess with you, but I'll make sure that no one else messes with you. So it makes it working a lot easier. Um, so because of the food shortages and you know everyone is getting really like tension is really rising. There's been a lot of fooding and a lot of riots. This is a grocery store the day after a uh, big riot in in Pomona. They just get completely destroyed. Um, this detail I really, really love it because I went to a grocery store and Caracas center had been looted and there was not a single box or a single bottle of anything. Really, and they had taken everything from the shelves. But there were these uh, two bolivar bills all over the floor. And for me, it was just like such a perfect example of the economic crisis, you know, all covered in mud and stomped on. I remember I asked a worker at the grocery store, you know, they, you know, they took everything off the shelves, so why is there money all over the floor? And the guy just looked at me and was like, because it's worthless. So this is an illegal gold mine. We went out there to do a story about malaria, but it was actually a really good representation of the crisis because we met people like engineers, um, people that have studied in college, uh, people that worked in offices and cities, um, but because the money has become so worthless, they decided uh, they had a better chance of providing for their family. They went to these gold mines and to do this really dirty, muddy work um, because you know earning in gold at least is a stable currency because the, the national currency, the Bolivar, it fluctuates. It's really unstable. Um, just to give you know, some, since we're talking about safety and issues uh, about how how we work. This was also uh, an area covered, controlled by mafias, right? So even to go in and do a story about malaria, we had to do the same thing like working in, in the slums. Basically go to, uh, you know, find the mafia leaders, sit down with them, and negotiate access so we could be in this gold mine. And we did that, and everything was okay, but they didn't pass the message down to all of the, I guess like the foot soldiers. And shortly after I took this photograph, I climbed out of the mine, which was several stories high, and there were about 15 guys uh, with guns, and they had our fixer, um, you know, surrounded, and they were shouting, basically telling him, like, you guys are journalists, what are you doing here, why do you have cameras, and uh, they were really, really upset. Um, and then I guess I want to tell this story because it she shows like why you always need to make sure that you have permissions and that you know not necessarily from the police but even from the mafias before you go somewhere because um, when that happened I mean they were trying to take our cameras saying that they were going to detain us uh, trying to take us away and we were able to you know calm them down basically just by saying like of course we wouldn't be here without permission you know sorry there's just a miscommunication you just need to call your leader and as soon as they did that. Uh, Everything was okay, and let us go. Um, so also, I mean, a story that we did that had to negotiate some tricky access with some international drug traffickers. So Venezuela um, has always been uh, along the route of like, people moving cocaine and illegal drugs and illegal arms from Colombia up uh, through the Caribbean. So this is a uh, home near, let's see exactly, but like around Kumana, no, around Guam. And basically, you know, these, these international drug traffickers have been moving small wooden boats full of drugs to Curaçao and to 
Aruba and for, for years. And whenever the economic crisis started, people started asking them, like, you know, I'm really desperate. I need to leave Venezuela. I want to go work. But I don't have uh, a visa to leave the country. Can you, like, smuggle me alongside the, the drugs? So they started putting people in these boats filled with cocaine. And I followed a group of migrants that had done that. I spent several weeks with them, uh, documenting their life up until they actually got on the boats. Um, basically, the same type of thing. Uh, I first talked to the migrants to make sure that they were okay with me documenting their flight. And they introduced me to the smugglers. And um, yeah, I basically had to negotiate with them to be able to stay in their safe houses and to stay with these women. Sides have really bad aim, and the press usually are in the middle. So 
So, you know, the, the police are firing rubber bullets and the water cannons and the, the tear gas. The protesters are throwing um, jars full of paint or human excrement or Molotov cocktails or rocks. And um, every member of the, of the press in Venezuela has been pelted by pretty much all of it several times. Most everyone, we wear the same clothes every day, and just they're covered with paint and all the stuff they throw at us. And also, of course, you know, most of the press wear black jackets and bulletproof helmets and gas masks all the time. Be able to take a photograph like this, you really have to have a gas mask on, or else you won't be able to see or breathe. This guy had made a gas mask out of a water bottle. I say it works. I don't know how. sides to think that you're neutral. 
because they think, oh, I saw you with the protesters, what are you doing being over here with me? Or if the protesters see you photographing the police, they'll sometimes accuse you of being like a spy or, or being there to, to try to photograph their faces so you can give them to the police. So you're constantly having to like play that dance of explaining to people that you're just there to cover both sides and what's really going on. This is from a memorial um, for a young man named Neil Mark who was killed. Right there where the, the candles are, or where uh, exactly where he was killed. The candles all around the blood stain. A couple hours after he was killed. They know if I don't talk to them, maybe at the end of the day, then they have reason to worry. Uh, we have a Mexico City Bureau, and there's a couple of employees there. But contingency plan, I mean, if you're like in one of these remote places and things go south, uh, I don't know, get your car drive really fast. I mean, it's, you just have to, you know, negotiate, talk. I mean, you're kind of got to hope that outside forces can kind of help you out in that situation. I mean, you try to plan as much ahead as, as possible. Um, and just try not to do anything stupid um, or be in, a, in really the wrong place. You know, that's why we, like you said, we did our due diligence and everything ahead of time. But you, know, you just got to use your instincts. Um, do you change hotels while you're on? Like, let's say you're in a place for a week. Would you change where you Yeah, sleep? you kind of change your routine a little bit. I don't know. It would depend. I mean, we'd have to be pretty freaked out if like, we thought, oh, we've got to change a hotel every single night. Oftentimes, you go to these towns and there's only one place to stay. Yeah. So it's, you don't have to options but uh, you on a lot of stories like this you don't tend to stay in one place for that long it's, it's different than um, there's a, a dear friend of mine uh, Kirsten Luce and she did a story in northern Mexico for National Geographic and they kept telling her oh this is a geographic assignment so you can spend all kinds of time there and she's like no you don't understand the longer I spend here the more dangerous it is like, I don't want another 10 days in this place I need to get in and get out so it's, it's a different set of circumstances. More often than not, we're hounding our editors, like, I need more time, I need more time. But in a lot of these places, you just want to get it and as, you know, work as hard as you can and then go and then maybe come back later. What about yourself, not, you know, when you're not doing urban protests, but you're going to, you know, for instance, when you're doing stuff on the end, it's place. Sure, so the New York Times has a really proactive security plan. Um, the main thing is to, to try to do everything you possibly can to prevent problems. Um, especially with security, it's always better to prevent than to have to respond to, to security problems. So for instance, I mean, we really like will not go on a trip until we have everything locked down. You know, even from the permission from the mafias or the permission from whoever's in control of the territory they were in. Um, that's something that I'm very, very strict about because I've had problems when I was younger uh, with security issues. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I really am very strict about having the permission from the mafia or the gangs wherever I'm at before we even fly to that area. Um, because just tra even traveling in and out and, you know, knocking on the door and phone calling is dangerous. And, but as far as contingency plans, um, I mean, before we're even allowed to go and do like, an interior trip like that, I had to do a, a very long security memo and talk to the New York Times security experts. Um, it's something that we talk about that my that they're constantly like monitoring our 
gotta feel really bad because I'm like, you know. <laughs> no, it's, like, like, it's like working for your parents, yeah. you know, like, where are you? Where are you going? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's something, like, security is extremely serious, and it's not, you can't take that lightly. Um, I mean, I work in Venezuela, and there's a lot of freelancers that don't have the luxury that I have to yeah. be able to work with the New York Times. It's very um, And with editors, it takes security so seriously. But we really, um, you know, everything from all the pre-planning, we have to submit a security plan, have it approved, have it discussed, and then it's constantly, like, you know, Michael said, you know, this is where I'm at, so we are constantly sending, like, your GPS locations. Um, there's maps, too, that monitor your location. And having a good network of local people, too. And that's especially important for freelancers or people who are thinking of going to some of these places and don't have a major institution to back them up, as it were. Uh, to have those local assets on the ground and people you can count on, like, hey, if I don't come back at a certain time. And they know people, so it, it's good to invest time and not just parachute in, like, oh, I'm going to go here, I'm going to go there, I'm going to you know, go into the slums of Caracas, or I'm going to go hang out in Acapulco and get these photographs, because it's, it's it just doesn't happen that way. So it takes tons of research. And I can't tell you how important it is to do your research before going to any any story, whether it's a light feature story or something heavier. But also, like, people going into these situations, they think, like, you know, the, the most risk I'm going to be at is that I'm going to get kidnapped or I'm going to get killed. That's actually not true. Like, you're most at risk by not having um, a secure car. You know, like, your car breaking down in the middle of a highway and then not having enough water. So yeah, more journalists die in um, car accidents than they do in actual assaults or war. So for instance, like when I go into the interior, our car has everything, you know, even like if we're stuck on the side of the road for two hours, I have enough water and food and water filters, um, you know, yeah, to fuel, you know, in case that happens, because that happens a lot. And people have been killed because they've broken down the side of the road in Venezuela and haven't been able to like make it through the night or you know for the next day. So it's not just planning things like oh take your bulletproof vest and take your helmet like that's really superficial. You need to be thinking of things like do I have water filters with me all the time? I have a water filter uh, in my camera bag at all times. And a fix fix a flat no. very important. <laughs> Tell stuff is great. It saved us in Iraq. Yeah, now we go we would always have three spare tires. Not yeah, that's right. Like, and we would have, I don't know, you know, we, when it was, got really, really muddy, we always had a bunch of wood and you know, cable to pull it on. That's a good point. Yeah, so, I mean, honestly, you have to put just as much time and, and effort into planning and logistics for those types of things. Like, if your car gets stuck, if our car breaks down, or if there's a, a roadblock and we have to spend the night on the highway because um, and you never know who's blocking it either. I have a question. You know, obviously trust is really important, and you're only as good as your sources. But you also, in, in these scenarios, you're all, you're only as safe as your sources to a certain extent. One thing that I found doing safety training in Mexico is that quite a few newsrooms have been infiltrated. So when you're working with the local journalists, how do you know they're clean? Uh, I have people that vouch for them that, that know, and I know that, uh, for instance, the photographer I work with in Acapulco, he's part of a group called Cuarto Oscuro, and if you haven't seen their stuff, it's an agency in Mexico, and they have phenomenal photographers and a great reputation. They've been around since uh, the Chiapas uprising in 94, so they're really trusted, and he had done work for the AP, and I know, I mean, I got me started in Latin America with the AP, so I, I know a lot of people down there. So I trusted that person. And then when you get down there, you, know, you have lunch, you feel them out, like, you, have, you know, what's it like? And, and it was great, you had an old beater car with no license plates on it, so I thought, okay, that's good. We can, we can roll them out and try into these neighborhoods. Because you don't, you know, you go to some SUV or something, you're gonna get in a lot of trouble. So you just kind of kind of know it and, and trust it. It's more difficult, of course, if you don't speak the language, um, then it gets more problematic, and then you have to hire someone to translate for you. And if you're on a really tight budget, a recommendation I would give you is go to the nearest university, any learning institution, and find an English language program. And usually you'll have a bilingual student there that will be willing to help you out, provided you're not gonna get them killed. But I mean, usually they'd be very excited at the chance to, like, oh great, I can practice my English, get paid, and, and this is exciting, I'll go do it. And so that's sometimes a, a good stop, yeah.
Yeah, I mean, you, you made a pretty good point about you don't get them killed, but you know, I, you had mentioned that one guy that you were working with recently realized that his tolerance of risk was much higher than yours. Again, how do you suss that out? It just took, oh, after being with him for a while, you know, and just judging by him, but I never felt like he was going to purposely get us in danger. I just think obviously he feels more comfortable because he's been there for 27 years. So for him, it's more comfortable to go into those colonies, whereas for us, plus we're not local by any means. I mean, I can speak Spanish, that's not a problem, but the reporter I was working with who can also speak Spanish is, you know, puro gringo. I mean, he's, you know, so it's, if they look in the car and they see us, and they did. They knew we were in these colonias. They had the motorcycles buzzing around and radioing in, like, hey, two gringos in a, you know, in a, in a shitbox car, and they're out in front of this place, and they're talking to so-and-so, and they monitored our position the whole time. Yeah, they'll know, they'll know you're there. So yeah, they know at all, yeah. Do you have anything to add to that? Um, just to your homework, you know, research, I always try to I work with local journalists. Uh, I don't hire fixers usually. I like, always prefer to hire, uh, you know, if I'm doing a story about crime, I'll try to find the, the very best, uh, you know, crimey reporter for the biggest newspaper or whatever I'm at, uh, and try to get them to, you know, be able to get a week off from their bosses, yeah. which they usually will allow them to do, um, and then work with them. Yeah, just hire pros all the time. Yeah, they're professionals. Now, the United States has a very fraught relationship with Latin America. We have not always been very nice to them. We currently have a government which is not very friendly to Mexico in particular. They've been threatening sanctions against them as well. How, as, a, as an American, does this create a problem for you or do people just take you for who you are as a person and it's not something that you really need to negotiate with sources and whatnot? Um. I mean, for me, being an American in Venezuela, everyone asks me that a lot. Um, but really, when I'm in the streets of Venezuela, no one cares. Um, I've been to, to anti-American rallies. Uh, you know, obviously been American, and people ask me where I'm from, and um, they'll either like, you know, chanting things against the, against the U.S. And but when I say like, hey, I'm I'm from the states, nice to meet you, you know, they'll just be like, hey, let's have a beer, or, you know, like, they're really friendly, so it's, I mean, I think it's a lot of more, like, government rhetoric, but I don't find that Venezuelans actually, like, have a problem with me because I'm an American. Um, you know, it's kind of like an abstract idea that maybe they, they don't support American politics, but it's not something they really carry out, you know, against an American, right? I think just based on how many, when you're in a place like Mexico, how many people loathe their own government, they go to separate people in politics. And certainly in Mexico, that's that's the case. I mean, usually the question is like, what's up with Trump? You know, what's the deal? Um, yeah, exactly. So uh, yeah, and as the relationship gets gets worse, um, I mean, who knows what will happen? But usually, there's there's really not a, a big problem. I mean. Uh, kind of leaving Latin America, but I might be in Gaza at Hamas rallies and they're burning the Israeli and the American flag, like you know, the traditional ritual and shooting AKs off in the air. And hey, where are you from? Oh, I'm from California. Like, oh, my cousin lives in Detroit. You know, it's like, hey, let's talk. You know, well, wait a second, let me burn this flag first. And then talk. So it's like it's not. They, there's a distinct separation, I think, and how it's going to affect the country I mean, now with with Mexico and the U.S., I mean, after this whole deal with the hurricane and earthquake in Mexico and not a word from the U.S. administration of condolence or assistance or anything, and then they rescind their offer of assistance. But you can see like an end to a lot of cooperation on, on drugs, on trade, on security, uh, and that will change the equation in a big way in places like Canada. They're just gonna be like, you know what? Open the door to Central America, and let them all just go through. Because right now, Mexico is stopping people from writing La, you know, La Lestia and coming up. And Mexico might just be like, you know what, we're going to stop doing that. You guys just go right on through like you used to. So that is the bigger, the bigger difference now with the relationships, right? Conversely, are you insulated to a certain extent being American because you're not a party to either side? Um, you know, I'm thinking when you look at the death toll of journalists in Mexico, they're not American. I mean, there was one guy that died in a kind of random thing in Oaxaca, but, you know, they target Mexicans. The Oaxacos and the yeah. politicians, they don't, they, they tend to leave 
Americans alone. Because they live in the towns that these reporters right. are reporting in. They like the Juarez or in Tampico or Veracruz, which is like the epicenter for this. Uh, the Gulf Cartel, they see the person's byline on a daily basis and they're reporting about these crimes and things like that. It's just like, okay, you can't report about that anymore and we're going to kill you and your entire family. And so that's how they, they silence these institutions and they have been very successful in doing it. I mean, there's most of these publications, uh, they don't report on any of that stuff anymore. Right. It's just non existent. Yeah. Uh, as a woman, is it an advantage? Or is it just not an issue? Um, I definitely been beat up and they didn't seem to care that I was a woman. Um, but I think being, you know, obviously a foreign woman, if anything it helps me not because they're afraid to lay, to, to beat or, you know, oppress a, a woman. It's more like the machista culture. Um, it's not that they, like, respect me anymore, but it's that they, like they think so little of me because I'm a woman <laughs> that I can slip by easier than you know maybe Michael could or you know some other big early photojournalist. Um, usually, yeah, and usually I, I work one of the few you know photojournalists working in Caracas, and when the guards would come up and you know really hassle the local um, male photojournalists, but they kind of see me as like oh you know <laughs> what kind can she do? So it actually works to my advantage. I like that they underestimate me because I'm able to sneak in a lot easier and, and do my work. Are there any other points that I would have that you want to raise before I open up the floor to you? No, no. Where do you, th where do you see, I mean, these stories have been changing very, very quickly. The situation is altering as we speak month by month. I think in Venezuela it's going to get much worse. Uh, every little analyst that we speak to, they say that it's going to get much, much worse before it's going to get any better. Uh, I think the government will continue to repress protesters and the, you know, the economic situation and the interior crisis will continue to get worse. So. Yeah, I mean, Mexico, it's, uh, they're going into an election year for the presidency, uh, so that's going to be pivotal as to what happens. But it's, you know, what can you possibly do when the market in the United States is so, so rich and powerful and demanding? Uh, and you have, um, I don't want to get a soapbox here, but you have pharmaceutical companies having legions of people addicted to opiates, and then they get addicted to heroin, and the demand is so large, like, it'll never stop. I mean. In Mexico, the government is making tons of money off of this trade. A lot of people, a lot of it's you know state government, municipal government, they're thoroughly corrupt. So, I mean, the only way you stop it is you have to stop the demand. And until that happens, Mexico is going to be plagued by this. And now, the, the worst part is that it's not just about the drugs anymore. Now it's just extortion and kidnapping and human trafficking. Human trafficking is, is you know a huge money maker for these cartels. They're diversifying their portfolios, you know, and like business speak. And it's it's really scary. And I just don't know if the government has the the appetite or the wherewithal to really try to hit it head on. I mean, Calderon tried to do it and the country paid a terrible price and now we're right back at the same homicide levels. Right. So I, I just don't know. I don't know what's gonna happen. Right. And then as you pointed out, if there's less support from the US or if there's huge economic pressure. Well, yeah, you have an attorney because general, like, let's get the war on drugs going back again and mandatory minimum sentences, all the things we know that have failed, they want to bring those back. And, and I just don't think that's, you know, let's re redo NAFTA and all this kind of stuff. I just don't know what that's going to do that benefit either us or Mexico. Right. Oh, very cheerful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so I mean, yeah, I'll, do, do people line up or do you have a preference? I, I like black and white a lot. Um, I've always really enjoyed it, but 
For Mexico, I did for a couple of reasons. Uh, the area we went to, Tierra Caliente, it was the height of the dry season, and it just looks like Cormac McCarthy land, just devoid of color, devoid of life, uh, dry, brittle, and so for me, and, and it was just, it, it felt fairly melancholy. And for me, it just, I saw it in shades of gray. I didn't see the color at all and when I was shooting it. And uh, my editor, um, we talked about it. And he's just like, yeah, just think in black and white. I'm like, well, that's what I'm doing. And, and we hadn't run a black and white story in two years in the post. And so we came back and we had to convince Marty Barron to run the story in black and white. But uh, he was he was down with it. We got two stories in, in black and white. But that's why I just, it, it was a black and white story. Acapulco lends itself more to color. Um, I saw color when I was there, but we wanted to keep it consistent, and it still worked really well. In, in that, so. Are you going to continue shooting? You said you're going to go back. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not going to say too much because the enemy's in the room right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to keep going back. Yeah, we're going to keep we're going to keep doing stuff down there. But in what form? Yeah, yeah. No, there's no way I'd mix it up now. I mean, now I just for this year I'm definitely. Follow it through in, in black and white for sure. Hi, I'm going to ask the same question of both of you. Do you have one particular memory where that kind of marks your on assignment learning experience? What is it? <laughs> That's a big one. I didn't know. <laughs> I, I do remember one. Um, this was some time ago. I was sent by the Boston Globe to cover Princess Diana's funeral in London. And I went there, and I was there for the week leading up to the funeral, and had some good days, made some good pictures. Uh, Life Magazine, for those of you who remember Life Magazine, they ran one full page, and I thought, like, oh, man, I'm killing it here. This is great. And then the day of the funeral came, and I totally messed up. And, uh, didn't get a single picture of the paper, was worked mercilessly over when I got back home. Uh, they just used wires for the whole thing. I was like, you know, what the hell happened? Uh, and so that was a tremendous learning experience for me of just, you know, being on the assignment, being in the assignment, being ahead of the story, being, you know, knowing where to be, where to go, and, and just concentration. So yeah, that was kind of like messing up and like ne vowing never to let that happen again. So. Uh, I like to let the editors decide that. <laughs> I think one of the things that really you know, transitioned me from being like a student to really kind of getting how to do this work is you know, it sounds kind of cliche, but it's so important to to really try to put yourself in the shoes of the people that you're documenting. Um, so often we're with people on the very worst day of their lives. You know, so especially like when I'm at a funeral, you know, I really try to think of, of the family and be like, what if this was my my sister or my father and there was a photographer here, you know, taking pictures of me weeping. I always try to really have that that presence and and carry myself and photograph in a way that just shows the utmost respect and you know, really shows compassion and, and respect for the situation and the day that they're having. Um, you know, tread lightly, but also, you know, just be really soft and, and gentle. And uh, some other younger photographers, you know, you'll see them in situations like at a, a homicide scene or at a funeral, and, and they just, you know, they're kind of over eager and they'll just rush into the scene and have their camera up in, in different spaces. and. Um, and it's just wrong. And also, when you when you do move slowly and and with compassion, people just forget that you're there. And that's when you really get those really heartfelt, you know, human raw emotional feeling, you know, photographs that I think are make strong photographs, right? And to be fair, to, to be fair, like in Acapulco, I made a point in photographing a lot of the moments of daily life that were going on because there's, yeah, the city is totally messed up and dangerous, and, but there's also a lot of great moments that are happening where people are enjoying the beach, people are listening to music and going out, uh, you know, in a very small area of the city, but it is happening. So it's important to be fair and accurate in that sense. And, and definitely, 
to tread lightly because yeah, I've seen some behavior on the part of photographers that just makes me really ashamed sometimes. Can I just ask a really, you'll have your time. <laughs> um, how do you decompress? I mean, it, it's training to deal with these kind of situations day in, day out, knowing also full well that you can leave and they can't. So how do you, if, if I can ask that person a question, how do you, how do you self-care yourself? How do you decompress after one of these type of, you know, days when you're with somebody on the work very worst day? So I know a lot of photojournalists, you know, they say like when I'm in the field, I have to just be so strong and not show any emotions. That's never worked for me. I mean, um, the way that I think I keep my head healthy and, and not necessarily need to decompress, but if I'm feeling an emotion, like, I mean, a lot of the photos that we saw, you know, they're really, really emotionally trying situations, you know, funerals, homicides, um, the day that the, the man was set on fire. Uh, I mean, my method is I let myself feel whatever I'm feeling. So if I'm just, you know, overcome with sadness watching a, a child die or, or, you know, being at a funeral or, or a homicide scene, um, you know, like the, the funeral photographs where the mothers were just, you know, weeping and weeping uncontrollably, I was bawling while I was taking those photographs because I was just so touched and so, you know, upset with them. I don't know, upset at them, but so upset with the situation. And I just try to process whatever I'm feeling as I'm feeling it. I don't try to turn it off or, be, you know, become numb to it. And not only do I think that keeps me healthy, but I also try to like channel those emotions through my work. Um, and I feel like it makes my photographs more real because I'm actually like feeling the scene and feeling, trying to empathize and feel the emotions, you know, that the people are feeling when I'm photographing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. When I was doing a lot of conflict and, and war photography in the Middle East uh, and other places, my therapy then was I would just hop on a plane and fly to Indonesia and go out on a charter boat off Sumatra and go surf with about 12 other people and just get as far away from humans as possible and just go surf these beautiful islands for two to three weeks and that for me was so therapeutic and, and just cleansing. Now, um, if I do stressful assignments and things like that, my therapy now is I come home and I act like a seven-year-old with my daughter and it's, like, it's really fun. So that's, that's therapy now. Hi, um, thank you so much for being here. Um, my question is about um, whether or not you work with writers and how that relationship works, or if you have captions to your photos, do you write them, and then where's the story? Is the story in the photo, or is the story in the text that accompanies it? That last question's a doozy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, oftentimes I'll work with writers, um, you know, I am a staff photographer at a newspaper, and Meredith, the bulk of her work is for a newspaper. So uh, I do work a lot, but it depends on the situation, because you often want to go where the pictures are, not necessarily where the interview is. So uh, on larger stories, like I was just in Houston for Hurricane Harvey, um, they called me up and said, like, hey, can you pair up with this reporter? And I said, no, I'm going to go where the pictures are. Uh, I can hook up with the reporter later, because they might be working on a feature story for the weekend, and it's still a breaking news story. So I'm not ready to break away from telling the news to go tell a feature yet. It's still too early for that to be irresponsible for me to do that. So, but a lot of times, yeah, relationships with certain writers can be really fruitful and really great. You learn a lot from them. Uh, usually, if they are based in that country, they're invaluable because they know the place that you you come into. Um, and so uh, it can be a really fruitful relationship, but oftentimes you have to be in separate places doing separate things. And yeah, we, we write our own captions. We're journalists. We're responsible for getting all that accurate information. Uh, we're telling a story as well with our photographs. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, I think both complement one another. So. Yeah, the same thing. I mean, it really just depends on the story. Sometimes you're doing like a, a quick story and I'd be like a profile of a person uh, so you'll go with a, with a writer and be at the person's home uh, and then while they're doing that sit-down interview I'm documenting you know, their life on the same day then also stories like uh, covering the protests and I 
never work with the correspondent because they're doing interviews while I have to be on the front line. Um, so it just depends on the story. But I would just say as a writer, I encourage all of you who are writers to work with photographers. Um, my favorite photographer to work with is sitting right here, Bob Nicholsberg. So I encourage you all to work with him. But if you can't work with Bob, work with other photographers because they see things differently than, they, than we do. They, they move at a different pace. Um, they're more visually oriented, obviously. And it's profoundly, um, you'll get a lot more depth to your story that way. Um, you'll just see things differently. Your story will be far richer for it. Work with these people if you had to. But definitely, I mean, you guys are students, right? So don't ever think that you can go out and just see the pictures and then the, the writer will give you all the information for the captain. Like, yeah, that definitely yeah, does not work. Yeah. Do not do that. That's the end of that relationship. Hi, thank you guys so much. I wanted to ask um, what measures are taken, if any, to protect the local journalists and the fixers? And is that something that you have to carve out yourselves individually, or is it something built to the institutions you work with? Um, so for the, at the New York Times, everyone that works on our team is under the exact same security uh, protocol and security plan. Uh, when I'm covering the protests, my motorbike drivers, I mean, everyone has the exact same uh, kit that I wear. They all have black jackets and bulletproof vests. And we also move as a team, so whenever we go into the interior, every single thing that applies to me applies to them as well, which is how it should. Yeah, at the Post it's the same. I mean, they are, they are members of the team, as it were, and will be looked after. And we had, I mean, the most dramatic example of that would be in Iraq, where uh, all the people that were helping us out, and when it became increasingly dangerous for them and their families, the Post helped facilitate them getting visas, getting them to Sweden, Amman, the United States. Uh, um, we have a, a, a dear friend, a fixer, that uh, he worked with us in Baghdad and now he lives in, in Arlington, Virginia. So, you know, they, they do take care of them and that is really, really important because like Meredith alluded to earlier, we can leave and they can. So any of the ramifications that result from the story we worked on, we can leave those, but they stay there and oftentimes there's vendettas and bitterness and, and you know, repercussions about that. And also, if you work as a, as a correspondent, if there's ever a newspaper or a magazine that isn't willing to take care of your people, I will walk away. Yeah, that's I mean, if, if you get me, if you're taking care of me, you're taking care of my entire team. And there is, I mean, that's not even questionable. And that's something as, you know, foreign journalists that have many, many more resources and connections than local journalists have in the countries that we're covering. Like, that's on you to make sure that you have not only yourself, but your entire team covered, and then whoever you're working for, even if it's on a freelance basis, you know, that they know what they're responsible for and that you hold them to it. Luckily, we work for big newspapers that already have those, those protocols in, in place, but um, I can definitely see how that might happen with other, with other newspapers. So, you know, you're not only responsible for yourself, you're responsible for your whole team, and also you have to keep that in, in consideration whenever you're making decisions in the field, right? Because the same thing, you know, we get to leave, but your fixtures, your drivers, they have to stay. So you need to be making all of your decisions based on, you know, making sure they're comfortable with all of And I, I think that is a really, really good point you raised because by including freelancers in it, you know, when you're, before you go on an assignment, if you are a freelancer, which I imagine quite a few of you might be when you graduate, you really shouldn't do these kind of assignments if you don't have the proper resources, both for security and also to look after your staff. I'll give you an example. I was on a freelance assignment for Al Jazeera America. And um, we were in Guerrero. Remember when those two freak um, tropical storms hit at the same time? When we were there. We were coming down in La Monta, and we were coming down the mountain and pelting with rain. We pull into out and pull the waters like, you know, like Houston High. And our, um, our our photographer's car, uh, sorry, our fixer's car was just shot. And Al Jazeera said, well, that's his problem. So the photographer and I, no, we, we, we ate the cost. I mean, a car in agricultural is not that much. But you know, we, we had the resources and the will to buy the guy a new car and get it fixed. And I, you know, that's something you have to budget as a freelance. You can't just leave these people in the lurch because you're not making enough money. It should be part of your 
the risk analysis or whatever you're planning before you go. But that should also be a conversation that you have with your editor before you even take an assignment that you'll see like that. Yeah. 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 Hi. Um, thank you so much. This was so good. Some of the photographs were just like giving me goosebumps. Um, I had two questions. One was, uh, to Meredith, when you go and like see people, um, the first photograph where they have not food for two days, how do you separate the, you know, the human part of you and just like, what would you do? Leave and just be neutral? Or how do you like react, especially since you said you did let your emotions come through? Like, you, we're not supposed, like, as well as not supposed to tell anything or like help them or like provide solutions. That's not the place that we can. I assume. So how, how do you react if they ask for something or like want help? So usually the way that we do that, it's actually uh, you can <laughs> like go have an interview over lunch or you know have a coffee with someone. So the way that I usually do it is I will photograph them uh, for as long as I need to. Um, you know, sometimes I stay, sometimes that's maybe just an hour. And then, you know, usually you'll say, like, why don't we go do the interview part over lunch? Because um, it's completely ethical to be able to, you know, take someone that you're interviewing out for lunch. That's the way that we do it. Um, another question was, how much gear and what gear do you usually take on your assignments? Especially in, like, a protest where you have to like swoop back and go into your like cars or school. Um, so I am really, um, I'm taking a lot of gear to cover anything. Um, like I said, whenever we go into the interior, our cars are locked, you know, prepped as if we had to spend two days on the side of the road. Um, the same thing whenever we go into uh, covering the protests, we have these really great Patagonia black hole bags that are uh, water resistant of the water cannons. Um, so basically everyone on my team has one of these backpacks and it has everything from uh, you know clip bars and all the water that they'll need for the day, um, my waterproof camera gear, uh, towels because we just get filthy all day. Um, I mean we, we go in with packs so with everything literally from food to water to uh, backup camera gear. And yeah, you tend to soldier through because the worst thing is to be in a situation like that and not have the, the gear that you need. You know, uh, cameras get smashed, cameras get soaked with water, um, gas mask filters, you know, run out. So our packs are heavy, and that's just, we just gotta deal with it. Fortunately, um, I'm not covering too many protests like that, so I carry as little as possible. Plus, I'm getting old and my back doesn't like it. So, um, I just pack as lightly as possible. Uh, and it depends on the story as well. Uh, for example, in Guerrero, I just had a small mirrorless camera for most of the, what you saw. Um, and I would keep an extra camera body in the car hidden away because I don't want to be going to these colonias flashing a bunch of expensive equipment. Um, I have it all taped up and beaten to hell. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I just yeah, keep it to a minimum. And then the other thing, I, I don't use zoom lenses very often. I don't, I don't like zoom lenses, but um, I just try to keep it really light. And now with mirrorless cameras, the way they are, they're, just, they're so great now. And there's no reason to carry around these monster SLRs anymore, I don't think, for, for that kind of work. I mean, if you're going to be shooting sports and things like that, that that's a whole different you know, set of equipment that you would use. But that's specifically related to, to camera gear. Um, as far as like, I didn't bring a Kevlar jacket or a helmet or anything like that on the, on the gun at a work because it would just be ridiculous of me to be walking around with that when no one else is. Um, so it was it was just, and I, I have a you know old ratty bag that's not even a photo bag, a camera bag, and I just put my stuff in there. Just nothing that screams, you know, photographer. Is anybody here planning to do video? Um, if you go to that movie demonstration, be the protest situation, so you're not bringing a Trump pop. <laughs> I know, I Hold it. <laughs> yeah, and as a matter of fact, I don't know if, if you've seen the um, movie The Streets. Um, it's a documentary about Ferguson. And like half the, half the documentary was shot with cell phones. Um, 
it's just something to think about. You want to be, particularly with video, you want to be super, super nimble and light. Um, yeah, the, the iPhone's a great camera. I use it all the time. Do, do you? Yeah, I have a, a big story coming out in the Sunday magazine that's all, the entire thing is iPhone. Yeah. Do you use iPhone? Well, just a couple of days There's been some that have had a shop shoot parts of them with iPhones. It's so light. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, but definitely with video, you want to go super, super clean. But, yeah. Um, this will be our last question. So this is for Meredith, but you can also answer it. In a country with so many things that are going on, how do you select your stories? I know you, you're, like, basically you're assigned to, but obviously you're the one over there, so you're the Sure, so we report news, right? So I always try to figure out what the most important news is. What do people that are in Minnesota, people that are in Minnesota, what do they need to know about the situation? A lot of the stories uh, about the crisis, we were the first people to report them, and it basically just takes a sense of you know, really be in tune with the country that you're covering, reading the local news. Um, we were the first people to really do an in-depth look into the medicine shortages. That's something that wasn't being talked about before we started reporting about it, uh, at least in the international media. But it's just, you know, being in tune with your neighbors. You know, I have contacts and sources and friends in different parts of the country that I'm constantly in contact with, um, just to kind of take the temperature of the country, right? And when a lot of those people started telling me, like, man, you know, I'm having a really hard time finding the certain medicine that I need, or man, I took my daughter to the hospital and they didn't even have antibiotics. Like once people in the facility started, you know, I started like picking up on those stories and I was like, well, we need to do a medicine shortage story. Um, so just being really in tune to where what you're covering and figuring out what needs to be told. News. Uh, no, I mean, yeah, it's just, uh, I mean, it's different for Meredith who lives in Venezuela, so it's uh, it's her local beat, so, you know, I'm sure, and yeah, you just know how you want to tell the story and tell it your way and, and make it yours. So for me, it's a little different. I mean, I'm constantly researching and I pitch lots of story ideas. I'm constantly pitching the editors, like, you know, this is interesting, let's look at this, you know, what's the result of this? Uh, and to get as many green light as, as possible. Um, so, just curiosity. You, know, you have it anyway, you're, you're a journalist. So. And also, like, how do, you, how do you pick stories? I always look for stories that haven't been told before. Um, yeah, I, want to be to doing, I want to be doing work that adds to the story of Venezuela. I don't want to be doing the same story about people waiting in lines that people were doing for forever. Or, for example, you know, there's dozens of journalists and photographers out covering the street protests. Um, but there are very few actually doing deeper stories about why are people protesting. So that's something that um, me and my editor David first there at the New York Times uh, really talked about. You know, of course we need to get to the streets to cover the protests, but even more so, like dig deeper into these food shortages and medicine shortages and, and crime, so we can tell the whole story of the street protests. Because what's the most important part of the street protests, right? Why are people angry at taking to the streets? Thank you. So please really give a big round of applause to